Good to see such a fine number here today. And I always know when it's a rainy day, it's going to be a good number in church because we're not tempted then to, uh, you know, stay away and uh, do some of the things that maybe we didn't get done yesterday around the yard, around the house, and so on. But uh, all kidding aside, pleasure to have you with us today and trust that this is a, a continued good morning for you. Uh, let me just make mention that uh, before 10.30 ever comes here at Bethel Baptist, there are many people involved in uh, ministry and uh, uh, seeking to make sure everything is properly prepared and ready for your arrival. And I won't get into uh, naming these that we appreciate so much, but some are here even earlier than I'm present, and we thank God for their ministry and the way that they bless us. I want you to uh, just remember, if you're part of the uh, Christmas uh, shoebox uh, ministry, uh, get those shoeboxes in today, would you please? Um, and if not today, uh, try to drop around the church very early this week, and we'll make sure that those uh, shoeboxes uh, get delivered. So thank you uh, so very much. I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles this morning, if you would. And turn to the book of First Thessalonians. We're into this series entitled Thessalonian Treasure, and we're in First Thessalonians chapter five. So turn there if you would, please. Last Sunday morning, I began a two-part message entitled "Do It to Your Pastor." Uh, sadly enough, there are some who have, down through the years, done it to their pastor in a not so complimentary way. Uh, but that which the Apostle Paul uh, shares to the Thessalonian believers is uh, meant to be very complimentary, and uh, he brings to us some challenges as to how we can conduct ourselves in regard to leadership in a local church. Last Sunday morning, we laid some foundational truths and principles related to, number one, mankind's temptation to resist authority. I've even seen that in younger grandchildren, how they can be so sweet and so perfect, and then all of a sudden, uh, they come out with a no, or they stomp their foot, or they stand there and they're not willing to respond to their mom or dad or even their grandparents. Now, that wouldn't be my grandchildren, but it'd be some of your grandchildren that find themselves resisting uh, authority. We looked last week at the scriptural teaching and regarding a charge to submit to leadership. That is not a very popular word, the word submit, but it's a Bible word. It's a Bible term, Bible concept, and we need to submit to those who are in authority over us. We also looked last Sunday morning at the Bible's teaching of equality of personage, and yet... God has ordained different roles, functions, responsibilities among the people of God. It would be a sad, sad local church if everyone was called to do exactly the same thing in ministry. We need balance and we have varying functions and roles, responsibilities that have been given uh, based upon many times our spiritual giftedness. And of course, every time a child of God uh, enters into a Christian walk, and of course that happens the moment we're saved by the grace of God, we need to understand that we've all been given at least one spiritual gift. There are some who have been granted uh, by divine enablement and appointment a number of different uh, spiritual gifts. These are sovereignly ordained abilities to be uh, utilized in Christian service. I was speaking with one of our gentlemen this morning and he was talking with me about some renovations. They're doing renovations and we're doing renovations and he said to me, he said, uh, oh are you doing your own? And I says, no, I says, we have a contract. That is not my ability. But within the body of Christ, there have been those who have been given the gift of, of serving, and it relates to caring for this building that we worship in, and also caring for the grounds upon which this building stands. 
And I think if you look very carefully and you're committed to finding that place for you to serve in the body of believers, you will find something that God has given you to do. And oftentimes, it equates perfectly with your spiritual gift. Now, one of those spiritual gifts that operates within the body of believers is, is the gift of what is called in 1 Corinthians 12, 28. We learned this last Sunday morning, the gift of governments. The gift of governments. And in another place, in Romans chapter 12, verse 8, where there are, by the way, seven gifts mentioned. One that I believe everyone here has as a gift. There'll be one of those seven gifts that you have to serve in the body of believers. And one of those gifts is the gift of ruling or the gift of leading. Uh, in the New Testament scriptures, there are three words that are used synonymously to refer to a person like myself. You would tend to call me a pastor, and that would be a proper term to use. God has given to the church pastors. Another word that is used synonymously, but never, uh, you know, the, necessarily at the same time, is the term bishop. Bishop. Now, that term, designation bishop, is used by a certain denomination, which I would submit to you, has misused or abused that title. And there have been those who have taken advantage of the meaning of that term bishop. And that is why, as believers here, we don't tend to refer to someone like myself as Bishop Bob. Okay? Uh, simply because of those who have uh, misused it. And then a third term that relates to both pastor and bishop is the term elder. Now the term pastor has to do with the issue of a man like myself, his shepherding, caring responsibility to the flock. In fact, in the scriptures, in 1 Peter chapter 5, and we'll get there in just a few moments, it says this, Peter says, feed the flock of God entrusted to you, which means give to them the word of God in a caring and a shepherding way. The term elder refers to the spiritual maturity part of a pastor. He not necessarily uh, doesn't need to be old, okay, although I'm there, okay, but there was a time when I was young, and uh, they could have called me, you know, elder at that time, but they tend to call me pastor. And then the third term is the term bishop. And that term refers to providing oversight or leadership. Okay? And so those three terms can be used synonymously and you can interchange them. But depending on who the writer was, the group to whom he spoke, the writer would choose a certain designation that was significant to the listener. But this term bishop has to do with the aspect of leading, overseeing, and providing that kind of role and ministry in the life of the flock and the lives of the flock of God. There's a gentleman by the name of H.B. London Jr. Okay. He uh, lived to the age of 81. He died two years ago with, with cancer. Some of you who are aware of the organization called Focus on the Family, you may have become acquainted to some degree with him because it was in the month of October, soon after he joined the ministry of Focus on the Family as a uh, ministry, a vice president of ministry outreach and pastoral ministries, it was that first October that he was serving with Focus on the Family that he instituted an event called Clergy Appreciation Month. Okay. How many of you have heard of Clergy Appreciation Month? Okay, well, you've heard of it, and it's 
good for you to hear it this morning, okay? Because it really related to his love and his passion for the body of believers, but also his love and passion for pastors. Because prior to moving into this uh, pastoral ministry role with focus on the family, he was a pastor for 31 years. And so he understood pastors. He understood the people of God. He knew what pastors needed. He knew what the flock needed. And he wrote a book. The book is entitled, They Call Me Pastor. How to Love the Ones You Lead. Tremendous book. One which mightily has blessed my heart down through the years. But in that book, on page number 11, a book that was actually published in the year 2000, he says this, and I quote, The first time someone called me pastor, it seemed strange. I not only felt too young to carry that title, but I also didn't uh, feel worthy or ready for the responsibilities that accompanied that God-ordained office. But he says, I grew to love the title. And to this day, respond to it with joy. It made me feel special when they called me pastor. Things like, pastor, thanks for the sermon. Pastor, I need to talk to you. Pastor, my mom just died. Pastor, we're, we're going to have a child. Pastor, God seems to be directing us to another church. Though, though, by the way, that phrase, that response from some, someone in the congregation is a real hard one to hear. It strikes at the very emotion of a pastor's heart. Because pastors love people and pastors are called upon to minister among the people. And sometimes you have these people who choose to leave the church. You've had them in your home and you've been in their home and You've sat down, you've prayed with them, and you've conducted a funeral service for one of their family members, and they come and say, we're going to another church. H.B. London goes on and he says, people will come and say, Pastor, I believe God has called me into ministry. How can I know for sure? You know, the x-rays do not look good, Pastor. Could you pray with me? We'll be moving to the East Coast next week. We will miss you. Pastor, when do you think you will have time to get a haircut? <laughs> it happens. You hear all kinds of things. Most so very good. Others of them, well, a little bit disconcerting. Pastor, thanks for being there when I needed you. London concludes by saying this. The list is endless, but you know what I mean and how it feels. Well, as pastors, we know what it means and we know how it feels. I'd like you to look with me for just a few moments this morning at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Notice verse number 12, where Paul says to the Thessalonian believers, and we beseech you, brothers, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. And notice, and to esteem them very highly in love, notice, for their work's sake. And notice, and be at peace among yourselves. Now, in verse number 12, you'll notice that with three phrases, the Apostle Paul designates those sovereignly entrusted with the, this function of leadership. And here's how he designates them. Three phrases. Notice phrase number one. Those who labor among you. He says, we beseech you, we beg you, brothers, to know them which labor among you. It's interesting that back earlier in our study in chapter two, Paul says to the Thessalonians, he says, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted to you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. Chapter 2, verse 9. For you remember, brothers, our labor 
and travail for laboring night and day because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. He designates these leaders in the Thessalonian church as those who labor among you. This word labor refers to strenuous effort resulting in weariness. It has to do with hard spiritual labor. A number of years ago, I was at an ordination council for a young man. And uh, after the ordination council, I spoke with a fellow pastor, and he lived, oh, probably only 20 minutes away. He had been pastoring there for a few years. And after the ordination council, he said, Bob, he said, well, what do you do in the afternoons through ministry? Well, I said, usually I'm out visiting. I'm in this home, that home, maybe a hospital call, uh, someone who would like to be counseled and so on. He says, really? And I said, yeah. I, I said, uh, what about you? He says, well, I'm usually over to the gym for a couple of hours every afternoon. I said, you are. He says, why don't you come and join me? Well, I said, I might come on one occasion or two over a period of months, but I said, there's, there's work to be done. I wasn't surprised that just a few months later, I heard that he left this church. In fact, I believe that he was gently nudged out because this was what I would call a lazy pastor. There's no place for laziness in the service of God, whether you're a lay person, but especially if you're a pastor, a bishop, an elder. Like the Apostle Paul, there's an expectation that there would be hard work that goes on. Paul talked about uh, serving in a, a capacity where he uh, worked probably in the morning so that he could minister in the afternoon and evening to the Thessalonian believers. They didn't have the resources available to pay him a salary. And so he says, that's not going to stop me. I'm going to work in this type of capacity, you know, probably making tents, because Paul was a tent maker, and he supported himself by earning money through that pursuit. But he worked tirelessly for the cause of Jesus Christ and for the people, the flock of God. Every church member has the right to expect their pastor to work hard proclaiming and promoting the kingdom of God, the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if that is not being evidenced, then he's probably not fulfilling, discharging his obligation to God and to God's people. So he says, know those who, notice, labor among you. That word labor is a work term. And pastors need to take that very, very seriously. Notice the second designation that he gives. And he says, to those who are over you in the Lord, to be both laboring among and to be laboring over a flock is a delicate balance which must be achieved by every leader in a local church. If you're laboring among people, you're serving in your pastoral role. If you're serving over them, then you're fulfilling your bishop or overseeing, overseeing obligation. God's people demand both. And they have a right to expect both. Notice he says, but labor over them. And he also says, those who are over you, notice, in the Lord. This implies the lordship of Jesus Christ. That ought to underline the ministry of every pastor. The lordship of Jesus Christ. Because every pastor who is a shepherd is really an under-shepherd. Because there is the good, the chief shepherd the Lord Jesus Christ 
And when you submit, whether as a lay person in a local church or as a pastor, it ought to always be with the lordship of Jesus Christ in view. Jesus would say to his disciples on one particular day, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I call upon you to do? On this particular day, the Lord sensed very clearly and knew that they were being disobedient. But as a pastor, we need to lead the flock by practicing the Lordship of Jesus Christ. How in the world can I expect you to obey the word of God as a pastor if I'm not living that out in my life moment by moment, day by day? But let me remind you that on occasions there are very much slip-ups in the life of a pastor. But that doesn't necessarily disqualify him from ministry. You know, whatever way you cut or slice this word over, O-V-E-R, there is no escaping the truth that it refers to superintending or overseeing or ruling. But we must do so in the Lord. We must treat people, love them the way that Jesus Christ loves them. Because they are his people. If you're a child of God here today, you should expect a Christ-like spirit from every pastor who would ever lead you. The scriptures make it very clear that there should never ever be any kind of misuse or abuse of a man's leadership privilege. In fact, in 1 Peter chapter 5, and verse number 2, it says this. He's writing as an elder to elders, those who are spiritually mature to others who are spiritually mature. And so he uses the term elder, and he says, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Now listen to this. Nor being lords over those who have been entrusted to you. There needs to be, from every pastor, a kind of, caring ministry as he labors among them and as well labors over them. And then he uses this designation. Not only ministering among them, not only ministering over them, providing oversight, but notice he says, and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. This word admonish is an interesting word. It means to put in mind. It has to do with warning or reprimanding someone firmly. <laughs> or it can mean to advise or urge someone earnestly. This has to do with the activity of reminding someone of that which they've forgotten or are in danger of forgetting. It has to do with reminding them of some of the hard issues in God's word that are meant to correct or reprove a child of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, in verse number 2, it says this, Preach the word, speaking to pastors. Be ready in season or out of season, which means be prepared to pursue and persist whether or not it's comfortable or popular to do so. We've got a lot of popularity preaching these days. A lot of messages you'll even hear on the television that come from individuals who are not proclaiming the whole counsel of God because when the whole counsel of God is proclaimed, there are some difficult issues that address our lives as the people of God. And that's why he goes on and says this, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. Rebuke is not an easy thing to hear. But if the shoe fits 
put it on. And when you come to a passage of scripture, as a pastor, there should be none of, well, I can't speak that because that will bother that person because I know what's going on in their life. Most importantly, God knows what's happening in this life and the life of every child of God. And that's why we have the wonderful balance in God's word of reproving and rebuking, but also exhorting and encouraging. And as you preach the word of God the way we're seeking to do, there will be some issues in your life that will be touched, and in my life as well. And therefore, it's critical that we are committed to listening to what God says, because he knows what is best for each and every one of us. Well, please understand there are at least five obligations that every child of God must strive to fulfill in order to maintain harmonious relationships with their spiritual leaders. Two of them are listed here in 1 Thessalonians 5. Three others are listed in the passage of scripture that Ryan read earlier, Hebrews 13. So, Listen up, because we're going to move through these as quickly as we can. Number one, an obligation in doing it to your pastor. Here's what it says. Know them. Notice what verse 12 says. Know them which labor among you are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Know them. This is an experiential knowledge. It has to do with experiencing certain parts of life with your pastor. It has to do with a fullness of knowledge. Interestingly, it says the same word for know is used of husbands in regard to their relationship with their wife. Where in 1 Peter 3, 7, Peter says, Husbands, likewise, dwell with them according to knowledge or understanding. Okay. There's a lot of men, perhaps even some of you here today, who don't really know your wife. Oh, you see her, you watch what she does, but you don't really know her heart. You know what she looks like, you know how she dresses, but you don't understand her soul and spirit. Peter says that ought not to be. Men, when you live with your wife, live with her according to knowledge and understanding. I can tell you, after 40 years of living life with me, my wife knows me. Probably 5% of it is not so good. She may say, say a higher percentage. <laughs> I would say 95% of those things are very good and don't get me in trouble. But you know, our eyes will meet. Our hand will touch each other. Our elbow will nudge one another. Our language together will tell each other. She knows. She knows. Do your best to understand and know your pastor. That which fulfills and hurts and disappoints and helps and pleases him. Know him. Know him. Secondly, esteem them esteem pastors notice verse 13 and esteem them very highly in love for their works sake this word esteem refers to the value placed upon someone or something how are they to be valued notice he says it in verse number 13 they're to be valued very highly this is a strong double compound superlative in fact, in Ephesians 3.20, this kind of compound superlative is used when it says that Jesus Christ is able to do, now listen to it, exceedingly, abundantly, above all. That's a superlative kind of compound. Words used together that are superlative in nature. You are to esteem pastors, leaders, very highly notice, in love for their works sake in love means sacrificially esteem them that way why are they to be so valued it's because of their work's sake and what is their work's sake 
if it's accepted and it's ministered properly, it is eternal in nature. Every one of you and every pastor have an eternal worth and value because we've been created in the image after the likeness of Almighty God. Now we come to Hebrews chapter 13. The passage of scripture read earlier. And here's what it says. There are three phrases that are used and they all have to do with those who are, have the rule over you. Notice he says in chapter 13, verse 7, these words. It says, remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. It means to bring or call to mind. You need to pray for your pastor every day. You need to pray for your leadership team here every day some of you I know are not praying you've admitted that that's an area of your life that you can develop and grow in and one of the things that you need to do is pray for those that are in leadership over you yes you need to pray for yourself in the areas of your life that need God's attention in by way of change you need to pray for your spouse. You need to pray for your children, your grandchildren. You need to pray for those that are in authority over you, including pastors. You need to remember they're human. They're tempted. They sin. They have marital and family needs. They face criticism, both constructive and destructive. They have feelings. They hurt. They get frustrated. Keep them in mind. And notice, when their faith and their conduct is anchored to the word of God, and it's anchored to verse number 8, which says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, then follow that kind of leadership. Dr. Warren Worsby, great Bible teacher, tells a story. He said, after I had announced my resignation from a church, I had been pastoring for several years. One of the members said to me, I don't see how I'm going to make it without you. I depend so much on you for my spiritual help. Dr. Worsby said, my reply shocked him. He said, and I quote, then the sooner I leave, the sooner you can start depending on the Lord. Never build your life on any servant of God. Build your life on Jesus Christ. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Pastors change, sometimes sadly, to their detriment and the detriment of the church family. Sometimes pastors leave, but Jesus never leaves. He never forsakes us. He's always there because he's the same yesterday, today, and and forever. Number four, obey them. Obey them. This is linked to submission. These are the words of the writer of Hebrews. I didn't dream this up. Okay. The Lord says it. That settles it. Here's what it says. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive for they watch for your souls as those who must give account let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Granted, there are leaders who misuse and misapply this command by requiring compliance to those things which no pastor has any right to try to enforce. A dictatorial spirit should never characterize any leader, and especially a pastor. This obedience calls for God's people to comply with every scriptural counsel, every scriptural guidance or truth provided. And so God's people are called upon to submit to that which God's word proclaims and do that which pastors lead you to do unless it violates God's word. Why? They watch for your souls. We're going to have to give account someday. 
And it's the pastor's joy and privilege to always give account in a positive way for the people of God. Finally, notice, salute them or greet them. This is not this kind of salute, okay? But this is a warm, endearing kind of, of greeting. He says, notice in chapter 13, verse number 24. He says, greet all those who rule over you and all the saints, those from Italy, greet you. Every believer should be on speaking terms, good speaking terms with their leader. Unfortunately, there are some of God's people who purposely avoid a pastor. Sometimes they purposefully avoid him because they're sensing some guilt that the Spirit of God has brought their way, something they've heard. And they just think that somehow maybe the pastor that week has been in touch with someone in their family and word has got out. The pastor hasn't known anything at all of that which has been going on in the family life. But the Spirit of God has taken the word of God that's been proclaimed. And so they'll skirt, skirt out the side door because they're fearful saying hello to the pastor. Should never be. Listen, we need to be greeting one another. Warm, friendly response to each other. You know... J. Hammer said this, I read of a church in Mississippi that wanted to encourage its pastor by placing a special article in the church newsletter. The author of the paragraph titled it, Boost the Pastor a Bit. The article was sent to a print shop and the typesetter went to work on it. When it appeared in the weekly church paper, however, the headline read, Boot the pastor a bit. Boot the pastor a bit. Although we smile at this, some people may feel that way about their minister. I trust that's not your experience. This gentleman said most pastors take their calling seriously. They recognize that they're charged with the awesome responsibility of feeding the flock of God and overseeing the flock. But sometimes... People don't appreciate the servant of God the way they ought. We will give account. You will give account. Every child will give account for their relationship with their pastor. Know your pastor. Esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Remember them. Obey them. Be submissive to God's word the word that is proclaimed, and finally, greet them. Do it to your pastor, to the will of God. We're going to invite Matt to come right now and conclude our service in prayer. Thank you for coming this morning. You know, don't you, that I have a pastor? He's a pastor of First Baptist Church in Waterloo, where I had the joy of ministering. For almost 20 years, I pray for my pastor. Pray for him every day. I pray for his associates. And I'm responsible for caring for him the way that he's seeking to care for his flock. He's a good friend. He's not perfect, but he's a dear brother in Christ. And I trust that in these days we're with you, that God will bless our ministry among you, and that we will be the type of of husband and wife, pastor and pastor's wife, that we need to be to God's honor and glory.